So the first is from a patient I had for 23 years. And she said, well, doctor, you know that the cemeteries are full of indispensable people. A little macabre, but so true. Uh, so the moral of that for me is don't get too big for your britches. Uh, but also when you, when you do leave, wherever you are, there will be plenty of talent to take your place. Um, secondly, there's an ancient Chinese proverb uh, that I read years and years ago. And it was from a book called Minimizing Medical Mistakes by Riegelman. And it goes, to be uncertain is uncomfortable. To be certain is ridiculous. Now, what's the moral there? So this one really speaks to um, the life of a practicing generalist, be it a, a family physician, an internist, a general pediatrician. Um, I think you need to be very brave to be uncomfortable and to live with uncertainty. Um, another one, um, probably many people have heard this, but it's, it's a beauty. Uh, to teach is to learn twice. And uh, this is by Joseph Joubert. And the moral uh, from that I get is um, I really don't know why anyone would go into academia unless they really love to teach on some, some level. And um, thankfully that has been my experience in this academic life and I'm really grateful for that. Try to find joy in the everyday. Um, be deliberate in surrounding yourself with positive people who give you energy to have your best interests at heart and get involved in projects that are really important to your own beliefs because they're going to give you energy and uh, they won't take away your energy. I do have a quote from one of my mentees actually shared with me uh, when she um, was sharing with me that sh how much she enjoyed our mentoring and she said basically that mentoring is a brain to pick, an ear to listen, and a push in the right direction. And uh, I think she's probably got it right. Based on what I feel happened to me at different points in my career, when you're interacting with um, faculty or family docs or students, whoever it is you're interacting with, and no matter what stage they're at, I really believe that if you see a special quality in them, a special value, a special interest, point it out to them, because they might not know. And in fact, I see that I surprise people all the time. I go out of my way. It's sincere. I would never do it in an insincere fashion. I do see fantastic qualities in people all the time. And sometimes, especially the young people, tend to react like, you're kidding. And I'll go, no. And, and then I'm quite explicit about it. This is what I think is really unique about you. And uh, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about that? So to bring things full circle, that kind of sounds like how Dr. Liebrack treated me all those years ago. When you find somebody who is willing to help you out, um, very important to recognize that and to accept that. And, and sometimes you find that somebody's mentoring you <laughs> without hitting you over the head necessarily. So I can give a, an example uh, that, that I personally experienced with Titus Awalabi, um, who uh, came as chief of obstetrics and gynecology shortly after um, I arrived at Northrop General as Chief of Family Medicine. So we were, um, uh, we were newbies at the same time. Um, there was a proximity effect. His office was on the same floor as mine. Um, as a family doc who does uh, obstetrics, um, I had the privileges in his department. And that there's always that sort of mutual interest connection. But he would invite me down the hall uh, from time to time to ask my advice about a problem in his department. And um, so he would explain what the challenge was and uh, you know, what would I do about it. And then he would <laughs> tell me what he was going to do about it. And he had much more experience as a chief because he had been a chief um, at St. Mike's. And <laughs> it took a while for it to dawn on me that this is how he was teaching me how to be a chief, by asking my advice, but then, uh, as I say, letting, letting me know. And it was uh, somewhat gratifying that I, it wasn't a question of like whether I get the right answer, but um, you know that uh, I would think about um, things um, or analyze them in a way that he found useful, but he was always charting his own path. I think we have to expect or understand then that those of us in senior positions will be viewed as mentors. And uh, in the same way that we need to be very careful what advice we give our patients, we have to be very careful what kind of advice um, we give to those who are junior to us and, and developing themselves, particularly academically, 
because they'll take it very seriously and it'll have a lasting effect potentially. Um, so that's quite a powerful role to be in. And um, I guess that's partly what mentoring is all about. The key thing, and I actually read this in an, in an essay that um, David Sackett, the internist, wrote uh, about effective mentoring, is that it, it's a relationship of generosity in which it's not about using the mentee to advance your own career. It's about really having the best interests of the, uh, of the person that you're mentoring at heart you remember Arne Aberman, the former dean of medicine, of course, who was very politically conservative. I'm left wing. We got along great. I had great respect for him. I still do. I remember he rattled off in his, you know, rapid fire style once to me over the telephone. He said, "You know, you know what it takes to be a leader." I said, "What is it?" Already said, "One, do your homework, meaning you have to know your opponent's argument better than they themselves know their argument. Two, don't lie, meaning no embellishment, exaggeration, or dishonesty." And the third thing, probably most important for me, was, and don't be too righteous about what you do. And I've actually quoted that repeatedly in lecture, lectures on advocacy or leadership or mentorship, because I think he's absolutely correct. You have to know your stuff. You can't be a liar. And don't be too righteous about anything you do.